you doing? No, seriously, what's happening right now? Of course, you're watching this video. But have you ever considered what it takes to allow you to watch this video? Or load a program on your computer? Or in fact, do anything where you interact with a software system? Whenever the question is asked, how was this program written? You could just say it was coded and be done with it, which would be correct. But if you consider this idea of creation further, you might ask, if a computer is acting on instructions given to it by code, how does it know what to do with that code? If you trace back the origins of what we call the modern computer, the question becomes, how did the original computer scientists communicate with a computer if they had no existing language or software to code with? Modern programming languages that you've probably heard of, such as Python or c -sharp, are often called high-level programming languages because they compound all the specific instructions you need, such as adding or assigning a variable, into intuitive functions that we can easily understand. Typically, they've been developed through iteration from a more basic programming language. Most programming languages are in fact very different from what a computer understands and are far from the fundamental actions a processor must do to handle information such as dealing with memory addresses and registers. In fact, there's a huge gap between human syntax and the way computers are instructed to be more than just very intricately designed heaters. Modern computing really started with the invention of the silicon-based transistor, which allow us to switch electricity on and off many times per second. But why is that important? Well, silicon is a semiconductor, meaning that under certain conditions it carries a current. As you can see, A and B are the input signals, and in order for a signal to pass through, both A and B need to be on. We call these silicon arrangements gates, as they can either be open or closed, you know, like a gate. If you tabulate the inputs and outputs of the first gate, writing down where it's on and where it's off, you can see the output for any combination of inputs. So, we can make circuits that which give us systematic outputs, which is great, but how exactly are these patterns useful to us? Before we can answer the title question, the last concept we need to understand is how to interpret these patterns. This closely connects to binary, or all those ones and zeros you see in hacking scenes in films. Let's go back to the table we made, which is technically called the truth table. To make this table more convenient, let's say that zero is when the voltage is low, and one is when the voltage is high. It doesn't matter how high or low the voltage actually is, as long as the difference between them is distinct and positive, to allow current to flow properly. The truth table will now look like this, where 1 and 1 is equal to 1, and 1 and 0 is equal to 0. This step is important for deciphering the output. Input A must be true, or 1, and input B must be true in order for the output to be true. This gate is therefore called an AND gate, and you can apply the same logic to the other truth tables. That logical process is called Boolean logic, which, as a side note, is fundamental when a condition needs to be tested in order to make a decision. For example, if the internal clock says it's 7am, then sound the alarm. Or if the shutter button is pressed, take a video. Back to the output of these tables. We've turned them into ones and zeros, but how exactly does this get us any closer to what we actually understand? You know, get the digits 2 to 9 and all the alphabets in the world. Think back to primary school, when we teach children place value, we're actually programming them to work in base 10. Our number system can be directly tied to the output of the truth table by considering the meaning of each digit in a sequence of ones and zeros. As we only have two digits available, we need to change base from 10 to 2. So when we get outputs from several different gates, we can read this as any other number in daily life. You might be wondering how we get punctuation and letters from ones and zeros. We simply have a worldwide convention that everyone agrees to, where a certain binary number gives a code defining a certain character. If we wire a processor to tell it the number of output digits to read at one time, it can interpret large strings of binary as distinct groups. By applying all these rules, we've formed a language. With all this knowledge, you might be able to see how we can bridge the gap between what processors in your devices are doing and what you want it to do. But what is it worth without an example? Here, I'm in MATLAB some simulation software to show you how the gates could actually fit together. This circuit in particular is a simple calculator which adds two numbers together. On the left, we have our inputs of high voltage. This is analogous to pressing a button on a calculator. This button press connects a circuit which gives a binary output of the number that you selected. These numbers go into the adding circuit. This seems complicated, but what I wanted to get across is using only the gates from earlier and some electricity 
we can create an arrangement which can add digits together. These adders, in combination, can sum larger numbers, giving outputs as ones and zeros. Just as we use binary to create the input, we can use binary to read the output, which will be the sum that we desire. This is, in effect, a crude summary of how to design a computer. We use as many logic gates as we need to give a systematic output for each input. We can even create one bit memory using basic gates. From here, all we need to do is tell the screen which LEDs to light up to represent each number. When the functions become bigger and more complex, the wiring and logic does the same. Thankfully, we can automate all this signal routing by packaging them into functions. It's probably better to think of the first computer programmers as circuit architects rather than people sitting and typing on a keyboard. In fact, when you like, subscribe and share this video, neither the words that you type nor the touches on your phone screen actually mean anything to a computer. Computers don't have an inherent understanding of images, words or even numbers. The first computer program didn't use any sort of language. It was just a circuit that created predictable outputs from inputs using logic. These have since been built upon to create the more human-friendly and high-level programming languages that we have now. When you consider that we can record video or sound, type equations and write sentences, all of which are human concepts and ideas, and we can get something useful and coherent out simply by putting it through a series of on and offs is amazing to us, and we hoped that we could convey that to you too. If you enjoyed this video, please check out one of our other science videos. Thanks for watching.